Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. After yesterday's budget, we can start today on a consensual note. Both the First Minister and I agree that George Osborne's spending plans are bad for Scotland. In fact, it was a typical Tory budget. Tax cuts for the top 15% of earners, but spending cuts for everyone else. When our schools are facing cuts and thousands of people are losing their jobs, a tax cut for high earners cannot be the priority. When the powers are devolved next year, Scottish Labour would reverse this tax cut for the top 15%. Can the First Minister confirm whether the SNP would do the same? First Minister. We will we'll set out our detailed income tax proposals early next week. Uh, these will be proposals that are based on our judgment of what is right for Scotland uh, now and in the long term. But let me be absolutely uh, clear today. A large tax cut for 10% uh, actually of the population, those on the highest incomes, at a time when support for the disabled is being cut and at a time when our public services are under pressure, is, in my view, the wrong choice. Uh, I think that money should be invested in our public services and in protecting the vulnerable, which is actually why I was so surprised uh, yesterday to hear Labour's Shadow Chancellor, John Macdonald, say that he actually supported these tax cuts. Councillor Dugdale. Presiding officer, people listening will know that that was anything but a clear answer from the First Minister. And let me explain why. Order. Let me explain why. Nicola Sturgeon has said this is the wrong choice, but she hasn't said that she would take a different one when she has the power to do so. This is an important issue. Order. Let us hear Ms. Dugdale. This is an important issue about our priorities. Now, Scottish Labour have been absolutely resolute, and we have been so since October. We would reverse George Osborne's tax cut for the top 15%. Yeah. Because when classroom assistants are being cut and teachers are having to buy their own materials, when the gap between the richest and the poorest kids is as stubborn as ever, when thousands of people are losing their jobs because of cuts to councils, a tax cut for the better off simply cannot be a priority. <laughs> this Parliament shouldn't be a conveyor belt for Tory austerity. The First Minister has spent her entire Order. career. Order. The First Minister has spent her entire career arguing that more powers means fewer cuts. So people deserve a clear answer. So I will ask her once again: Will she back Labour's plans to reverse George Osborne's tax cut for the top 15 per cent? Yes or no? First Minister. I think if we can just dispense for a moment or two with the mock indignation and reflect on the fact that for any fair-minded person who was actually willing to listen to my answer, it was a very, very clear answer Absolutely. indeed. I said, I said that the choice of giving a fairly hefty tax cut to 10% of the population, the highest income earners in our country, was the wrong choice. I think that's fairly clear. I then uh, said that we would set out our plans for income tax uh, early next week. I've always said we would set them out prior to the dissolution of this parliament and that's what we will do. Uh, but finally I said uh, I thought we, would, we should and would choose to invest that money instead in our public services and protecting the vulnerable. For anybody who's fair-minded uh, listening to what I said, I think they will find that a very clear answer indeed. But, uh, and that's why I would say uh, to Kezia Dugdale, given that I'm uh, answering this question very, very clearly, perhaps she should not waste her energy on trying to persuade me of this argument. Instead, she should use her energy trying to persuade Labour's shadow chancellor, who said yesterday that Labour would support the increase in the 40 pence threshold. Twice I have asked the First Minister. Yeah. 
Arthur! Arthur! Twice I've asked the First Minister. Mr. Mr. Twice I've asked the First Minister if she will reverse George Osborne's tax cut for the top 15%. Both times she has told me that she doesn't support the plan, but she hasn't yet said if she would reverse it. Now, the new tax powers that are coming to Scotland give us a real opportunity to stop George Osborne's cuts. I have said already, this Parliament is not a place that surely should pass on Tory austerity. It should stop it. Faced with a choice between using the powers of this Parliament to invest or carrying on with the cuts, we can choose to use the powers. Now, if we can't get a clear answer on the top 15%, let's see if we can get one for the very richest few. I believe the top 1%, earning more than £150,000 a year, should pay more tax so that we can invest in education. Page 5 of last year's SNP manifesto said this. We will also vote for the reintroduction of the 50p top rate of tax. Will this year's SNP manifesto make the same commitment? First Minister. I think, I think the problem for Kezia Dugdale is that people watching this uh, are starting to laugh not with her but at her as she pointedly refuses to hear what I am saying. So let me try let again. Let us hear the First Minister, let me Mr. Bibby. Presiding officer, and let me make it uh, as simple as possible. Uh, the Scottish Government. Uh, will set out our detailed income tax proposals early next week before the dissolution of Parliament, as we committed to do. Uh, secondly, uh, I have said, and I will say again, now I think for the third time, that the decision taken by the Chancellor yesterday in the same budget that he cut support for the disabled, that he confirmed that the Scottish Government's budget between now and 2020 will reduce by £1 billion in real terms, at a time when he piled more pressure on our public services, then I think the decision to give a large tax cut to 10% of the population at the highest end of the income spectrum is the wrong choice. Clearly, if I think it's the wrong choice, presiding officer, it's not a choice I'm going to make myself. Perhaps that is simple enough for Kezia Dugdale. Because I think at a time uh, when our services are under pressure, then it's important that we protect our public services and, of course, also protect those things that taxpayers in Scotland enjoy, that taxpayers in England don't enjoy, protecting free education uh, for young people going to university, protecting free personal care for our older people, protecting free medicines for people who are sick. Uh, so I'll continue to take decisions that are fair and balanced and in the interests of people across our country, in the interests of our public services, in the interests of our economy. And I'll leave Labour in their desperate, increasingly desperate battle to hang on to second place. I think the people watching this at home are wondering why the First Minister of Scotland can't answer a question with a simple yes or no answer. Yeah. And do you know, do you know, presiding officer, that, that answer... Order. That answer was a bit like the First Minister's answer on fracking, because she says that she's highly sceptical, but she won't actually spell out how she would do it any differently. The First Minister tells us that she's against the cuts and opposes the Westminster's austerity agenda. Yet when faced with a choice between using the powers of this Parliament to invest or carrying on with the cuts, the First Minister chooses cuts and refuses to use the powers. She's just stripped £500 million out of school budgets and the services of vital public services. She won't confirm that she will reverse Osborne's tax cut for the top 15% and she won't even commit to her manifesto pledge from last year on the 50p tax. Because the powers of this place mean that we can choose a different path from the Tories. We have a choice. We can either wring our hands and wave the cuts through like the SNP choose to, or we can use the new tax powers to end austerity like Labour argue. So can I ask the First Minister, is there any power she's prepared to use to stop the cuts? 
First Minister. You know, this, this line of questioning from Kezia Dugdale reminds me a bit of the Labour Party in Scotland generally going absolutely nowhere. You know, when Kezia Dugdale was scripting these questions, you would have thought that she would have factored in the possibility that I would actually answer the question at the first time of asking and then have the ability to amend the questions that come later. So let me say, I think now for the fourth time, I think George Osborne's decision to cut taxes for 10% of the population at the highest end of the income spectrum is the wrong choice and I will not take that same choice. Now, four times. Surely somebody on the Labour benches must have understood it. But let me, let me also say this. Order. Unlike Labour, I've also set out what I'm going to do with local taxation. We've not heard that from Labour yet. So I've set out plans on local taxation. Within a few days, I'll set out plans uh, on income tax. Those plans taken together will be fair, they will be reasonable, they will be balanced, they will protect our public services and they will protect our economy. That's the position that I will continue to argue. And that's perhaps why we see today that trust in this Scottish Government is at an all-time high. Perhaps that's something Kezia Dugdale might want to reflect on uh, when she is continuing in opposition in whatever side of the chamber that might be. Question number two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Tonight. Ruth Thank Davidson. You. Now, officer, many of the income tax decisions taken yesterday in the budget will not apply to Scotland's workers. Those decisions will be for this Parliament to make, and they require serious analysis and proper thought. Last year, the Scottish Conservatives brought together an independent commission of experts to study this issue in detail, and their recommendations were published in January. The First Minister has her own team of economic advisers as well as an army of civil servants at her disposal. And we've all known that these powers were coming. So can I ask her, what detailed analysis has she published on how we use these new tax powers to strengthen Scotland's economy? First Minister. Well, as I've just said to Kezia Dugdale, we will set out our proposals on income tax early next week. That's just in a few days' time. Uh, and we will set out, when we do that, the analysis that backs up the decisions uh, that we have taken on income tax. But it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, because uh, Ruth Davidson has just said that she appointed a commission uh, to look into how we use uh, new income tax powers in the way that is best for Scotland. And yet it seems to me, from what Ruth Davidson is saying, is that she doesn't propose to use them at all. She's simply going to mimic George Osborne. That's the wrong choice for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. I think it's quite obvious to see that there's been no analysis or evidence base put forward already. And you can run through the minutes, actually, of the First Minister's Council of Economic Advisers at any point in the last year. And incredibly, the new tax powers uh, don't even merit discussion amongst them. Um, and I think we did see that yesterday when we saw the Deputy First Minister on television like a rabbit in headlights about how these powers are going to be used. And I am clear, First Minister, I want a sign at the border. I don't want to see a sign that says higher taxes here because I think that's the wrong choice for Scotland and I'm not the only one. In this morning's press, Jack Perry, the former Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, wrote this, and I'll quote it directly. A further tax grab will only weaken our tax base and depress the economy. That will do nothing to help support schools, hospitals and the ageing population. Mr Perry ran Scotland's main enterprise body for five and a half years. He's not a politician. So can I ask the First Minister why is he wrong? First Minister. Well, I'll set out my proposals in income tax, as I've said uh, repeatedly today, but it, it's interesting, Ruth Davidson's not proposing to use the income tax powers. How many times has Ruth Davidson over the past year stood over there and said to me, the time is soon when you're going to have to decide, we're all going to have to decide how we're going to use those income tax proposals, and yet she is not proposing a single iota of difference uh, from the tax proposals of George Osborne, as she confirmed at our conference. She uh, led the, the troops up to the top of the hill promising a 30 pence tax ban and then said when she got them there that she was going to march them straight back down again. So she's going to mimic George Osborne. I'm going to take decisions that are right for Scotland. And if Ruth Davidson wants to talk about differences between Scotland and England, well, here's some differences between Scotland 
and England. Unlike in England, if you're a taxpayer in Scotland, your children don't pay for a university education. If you're a taxpayer in Scotland, unlike in England, you don't pay for free personal care for your elderly parents. If you're a taxpayer in Scotland, unlike in England, you get medicines free when you're sick. Of course, these are some of the benefits that taxpayers in Scotland get, unlike in England, that Ruth Davidson wants to take away. So perhaps she will answer how much do the Tories think people should pay for a university education and how much would she have the prescription charge returned to? Let, her, let us have some answers from Ruth Davidson before she's got the nerve to stand here and lecture anybody else. I have some constituency questions. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, earlier today I received notification that Z Hinchcliffe, a textile company with a factory in Doray in my constituency, has begun issuing 90-day redundancy notices this morning to its 86 employees. This is despite the factory being in full operation throughout an initial 30-day consultation period. The company claims to be in negotiation with a potential buyer, but has refused to name that buyer or allow Scottish Enterprise to help find another. Management, based in Huddersfield, has also refused to let the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment team into the factory to speak to the workers. Given these circumstances, what pressure can be put on Zed Hinchcliffe to ensure the workforce is given the assistance they need and deserve at this difficult time? First Minister. Well, can I thank Kenny Gibson for that question? Obviously, I'm aware of this uh, developing situation and I'm very concerned indeed to learn of the situation at Z Hinchcliffe and Sons Limited in Dalry. Uh, this will be a very anxious time for the company's employees, for their families and indeed for the local community. Fergus Ewing will be engaging directly with the business uh, and I can give uh, Kenny Gibson an assurance that we will do everything we can to ensure that the workforce is given the assistance they need and deserve at this difficult time. And I undertake today uh, that Fergus Ewing will keep the member fully updated about these discussions. Cara Hilton. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware that Long Annett Power Station in my constituency will close at the end of the month with the loss of 236 jobs locally and over 1,000 jobs across central Scotland in the supply chain. A £9 million economic recovery plan has been drawn up by five Clack Manager and Falkirk councils. The plan is vital to the long-term economic regeneration of the area, enabling recovery from what is going to be a devastating blow to Concarden and surrounding communities. I was disappointed to hear this week from Fife Council leader David Ross that the plan is not going to be funded by the Scottish Government. Will the First Minister please reconsider this position before Long Annick closes on the 31st of March to ensure that the communities I represent have got a fighting chance of recovery? First Minister. Well, of course, we established the task force uh, to look at these issues, uh, the multi-agency, multi-partner task force, uh, when the decision was announced about the, the future of Long Annick. Um, we continue to engage with the Council about proposals to support uh, economic regeneration and recovery in the area. Uh, of course, we've also been working through the task force and through uh, our PACE organisation to help individuals into alternative employment. And I understand many of the individuals employed at Longana have uh, been able to move into alternative employment. So we will continue to engage with the local council uh, through the task force and, of course, with uh, members who represent this area to make sure we are doing everything possible and appropriate to help individuals but help the local economy as well. James Donnan. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, you'll be aware of the announcement by Clyde Pumps, part of the SFX group and based on my constituency, that consult consultations have already begun with unions over the prospect of the company making 114 workers redundant. If this comes to pass, this will mean over one third of the workforce will have gone in the last 12 months after a loss of 90 jobs last year. Given the importance of this company to my constituency, for example, both my brother and mother worked in it, and as we as it's been in Newlands Road since 1886, can the First Minister tell me what the Scottish Government can do to help the workers threatened with redundancy and the company to help them through this temporary downturn in the oil and gas industry? First Minister. Well, again, uh, I'm very acutely aware of the situation, but also of the impact it will have on those who work there, their families and the local area. Indeed, as the MSP for the neighbouring constituency, I uh, know the, the impact of this employer and indeed how long-standing it is in the, the south side of Glasgow. Uh, I can tell James Donnan that Scottish Enterprise met yesterday with the company uh, to explore all possible options for supporting the business and for retaining its highly skilled employees. Uh, our partnership, Action for Continuing 
a new employment pace uh, team has also been in contact with the company and are offering support for affected employees and pace will remain in contact uh, with employees and with the company throughout the consultation period so again we will do everything possible to make sure all options are explored and the workforce is giving given all the support that they need and deserve at this time question number three Liam MacArthur what the Scottish Government's response is to the final report of the Commission on Widening Access. First <coughs> Minister. Well, I warmly welcome the report from the Commission on Widening Access. It was published on Monday, and let me take the opportunity to thank Dean Ruth Silver, the Chair of the Commission, and all the members of the Commission for the very uh, good work that I think they have done. Uh, I've repeatedly made clear my personal commitment and ambition, indeed the commitment and ambition of this government that every young person, no matter their background, will have an equal chance of going to university if that's what they choose to do. Uh, that's why we immediately accepted the Commission's recommended targets to maintain the urgency and focus needed uh, so that by 2030 students from the 20% most deprived backgrounds should represent 20% of entrance to higher education. Uh, we will now consider the other findings and recommendations carefully and if we are re-elected we will bring forward a full response very early in the next Parliament. Lee McArthur. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? Presiding officer, widening access must be tackled right from the start of schooling. Having seemingly abandoned the area-based approach to raising attainment in schools, which ignored the needs of too many children in too many parts of the country, will the First Minister now accept our idea of a pupil premium is the best approach for the whole of Scotland? And given how important colleges are as a gateway to learning, having rejected our penny for education proposal, how will the First Minister prevent her damaging cuts to council education budgets and colleges undermining efforts to meet her new university targets? First Minister. Well, firstly, Liam MacArthur is right to say that uh, dealing with the issue of access to university it requires not just the efforts and the input of universities, it requires all of us uh, right across the system to play our part. And that's why the Commission was right to call it a whole system problem that needs a whole system solution. In terms of uh, the rest of Liam MacArthur's question, we've not abandoned anything. Our attainment fund, which was doubled uh, by the Deputy First Minister in the budget, will continue to provide dedicated support to primary schools in our most deprived communities. And it's already providing support to more than 300 uh, primary schools across the country. In addition to that, we will extend the reach of our attainment fund using the £100 million uh, that is going to be raised every year through reforms uh, that we've announced to local taxation. Uh, and that money will be allocated to schools on the basis of uh, eligibility for free school meals. So it will go direct to schools, direct to head teachers on the basis uh, of greatest need. Uh, and taking together, uh, both with what uh, the Deputy First Minister announced in the budget and what I announced at the weekend, that means that over the life of the next parliament, if we are re-elected, there will be an additional uh, three quarters of a billion pounds spent specifically on tackling attainment in our schools. Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. One of the uh, Commission's uh, recommendations was that care-experienced young people who find their way to university should be supported by a full grant uh, while they are at university. That will certainly be part of Scottish Labour's manifesto. Will the First Minister commit to that recommendation too? First Minister. I think it's a good recommendation and I'll set out uh, our response uh, to that over the next uh, few weeks of the election campaign. Uh, actually, though, uh, Ian Gray has not uh, been as full as he could have been in, in talking about the uh, recommendation here because it didn't just say what it said um, about uh, grants uh, versus loans for uh, students with care experience. It also said that where uh, students leaving care or with a, an experience of care, where they meet uh, minimum access requirements, they should be guaranteed a place in university. I think these are sensible recommendations and can have an impact on our goal of uh, making sure there's equal access to university will be one of the recommendations that we consider very carefully. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, First Minister. One of the concerns that uh, was expressed in the report was the fact that in some schools, uh, for some hires and for some advanced hires, there are not sufficient number of teachers to be able to offer these courses. Could I ask what the Scottish Government is doing about that situation? First Minister. Well, there's many uh, suggestions that have been made by many different people about how we make sure, uh, as part of uh, ensuring equal access to university, we make sure that all young people have access to the subjects when they're at school. Uh, one of the uh, suggestions that I I uh, think has got uh, particular merit is, is the idea of, uh, not just for this reason, for other reasons,
reasons as well, is the idea of schools working uh, much more in clusters uh, so that you know, where a particular subject might not be offered in one school, uh, it can be accessed in another school. So there's a lot of serious work being done here by the Commission and by others who have an interest. Uh, the output of all of this work will certainly be reflected in my party's manifesto. And as I say, if we are re-elected, we'll bring forward a full comprehensive response uh, to the Commission's report very early in the next Parliament. Roderick Campbell. Um, First Minister, one of the recommendations in the report is that those who compile key university rankings should ensure greater priority is given to socio-economic diversity within the rankings and that those institutions who take those actions should not be penalised. What's the government's view about that and how can we allay the concerns of universities about the ranking implications? First Minister. Well, I strongly agree with what the report has to say here. It is absolutely essential that university rankings are not compiled in such a way that universities find themselves penalised for doing the right things in terms of widening access to students from our more deprived areas. Uh, our world-class higher education system is rightly a source of great pride to us, and rankings are understandably important to institutions in terms both of their reputation and their income. Uh, but there is, and the report makes this clear, there is a strong and growing body of evidence to suggest that socioeconomic diversity improves standards and it improves the educational experience of all students. Uh, therefore, uh, students should, uh, universities should be credited, not penalised, if they uh, make their student body more diverse in this respect. So I think that is a strong uh, recommendation backed by strong analysis, and of course it will form part of our uh, response to this report early in the next Parliament, should we be re-elected. Question four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK budget. First Minister. Well, as a result of yesterday's budget, between now and 2020, Scotland will see £1 billion in real terms uh, cut from the day-to-day -day budget that pays for our public services. And, of course, that's before uh, the impact of the hidden £3.5 billion uh, pounds, uh, in the budget is, is fully understood. Uh, the budget statement yesterday, I, I think, delivers very little for Scotland. The modest consequentials that we receive are almost certainly wiped out by the increase in public sector employer pension contribution costs from 2019. So, as uh, you will have heard me say, uh, presiding officer, in earlier stages of uh, these exchanges, we will continue to do everything within our powers to protect the most vulnerable from austerity measures, to protect our public services uh, and to protect our economy. I thank the First Minister for that reply. Does the First Minister agree with me that this is a budget which will hammer the poorest and disabled in society, whilst at the same time helping higher earners, and that cutting employment and support allowance by £30 and changing elig eligibility to personal independence payments, yeah. which will slash £130 million worth of support to disabled people in Scotland, will have a hugely damaging effect to those affected and is a typical Tory action by a savage Tory Chancellor? First Minister. I do. And you know, these changes to personal independent payments, uh, I think, are cruel on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. They are going to result in Scotland in around 40,000 disabled people being made worse off. Uh, and of that 40,000, uh, two thirds could be worse off uh, by almost £3,000 a year. And the remainder uh, could be worse off uh, by almost £1,500 a year. Uh, when these changes were first proposed in January, uh, the Scottish Government, alongside disabled people and a range of disabled charities, made clear to the UK Government that we were fundamentally opposed to these changes that would narrow the eligibility for benefits that support disabled people in their daily lives and will continue to press this case. And of course, as uh, power over disability benefits comes uh, to this Parliament, we will make sure we build a social security system that treats people, particularly our disabled people, with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. Question five, Malcolm Tism. Uh, to ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that all cancer patients have timely access to diagnostic tests. First Minister. Well, our new £100 million cancer strategy was published by the Health Secretary on Tuesday. That aims to improve the prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment and aftercare of those affected by 
by this devastating disease. £15 million pounds of this funding will be used to deliver an additional 2,000 diagnostic scopes each year and to fund additional diagnostic capacity to ensure that people who are suspected of having cancer receive swift access to the diagnostic tests that they urgently need. Uh, President Officer, I, may, I believe this may be Malcolm Chisholm's uh, last appearance uh, at First Minister's questions, unless he's got questions planned for me next week. But just in case he hasn't, if he'll allow me, I'd like to recognise his service, uh, not just to this Parliament, but to the National Health Service. Uh, when Malcolm Chisholm was uh, Health Minister, amongst his other achievements, he abolished trusts in Scotland and he brought the Golden Jubilee back into public ownership. I think these are landmark achievements. So I thank him for his service and take the opportunity to wish him well for the future. Mm. Well, Malcolm Chisholm. I thank the First Minister for her uh, very uh, kind words. I was going to say as a preamble that I think there has been great progress uh, in cancer care during the years of the Scottish Parliament under uh, this and the previous administration. But I, I wanted to highlight today uh, the Cancer um, Research UK campaign, uh, Scotland versus Cancer, and wonder if uh, she agrees that they have been right to highlight uh, the issue of uh, the long waits that some people have for diagnostic tests. So I certainly welcome the measures that she has referred to in the cancer strategy this week, but can she uh, give us a, a bit more uh, detail about the timescale for the proposed changes and what effect she uh, thinks they will have? First Minister. Uh, well, I do uh, agree with Cancer Research UK. Uh, I think amongst, obviously we need to make sure we've got world-class uh, care and treatment for people who are diagnosed <coughs> with cancer. Uh, but what we need to do most is make sure we maximise our efforts to prevent it, but also diagnose it as quickly as possible so that people get access uh, to the best care as quickly as possible. That's why our Detect Cancer Early programme is so uh, vitally important. Waiting times uh, at all uh, stages of the, the cancer journey are, are much shorter than they were in previous years, uh, but particularly around diagnosis, uh, we're determined to go further. And that's why uh, the actions that I outlined in my earlier answer are so important. In terms of timescales, uh, this is a cancer strategy that we will start to implement immediately, as well as the additional diagnostic capacity that I spoke about. Uh, we'll also invest to increase the capacity uh, for radiotherapy uh, treatment, because as technology developments, that becomes more and more important in the, the treatment of cancer. So whether it's prevention, diagnosis or world-class treatment, we have to make sure we are doing everything possible uh, to continue to reduce death from cancer. Uh, there can be few things more important to any parliament anywhere. Question number six, Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government expects a new film studio for Scotland to be delivered. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, with Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland are firmly committed to supporting the growth of the screen sector in Scotland uh, and this is underlined by the record £24.1 million awarded to support the sector uh, in 2014-15 and the extra £4.75 million we announced last year across three new funds. I'm pleased to say that proposals for a permanent film studio in Cumbernauld uh, by Ward Park Studios Limited are now progressing well. A planning application for extensive development facilities was submitted to North Lanarkshire Council on the 11th of March and we hope uh, and expect that the new studio will be operational no later than the end of 2017. Under Fraser. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? She'll be aware that the film industry in Scotland has made it very clear its dismay at the non-delivery of a long-awaited film studio. Last week the Culture Secretary told us that the Scottish Government would be uh, supporting an extension to the Ward Park facility in Cumbernauld by 30,000 square feet. But we don't know when or indeed if that will actually be delivered. And in the meantime, the Scottish Government is sitting on a planning application for a 230,000 square foot facility at Straton. So what confidence can we have from the Scottish Government that something will actually and eventually be delivered that meets the industry's needs? First Minister. Well, it, it's certainly true that Murdo Fraser didn't know when it would be delivered before I answered his first question, but he should know now, no later than the end of 2017. Now, everybody else heard me, everybody else is hearing me today, aren't they? Because <laughs> Kezia Dugdale certainly didn't appear to be, and now Murdo Fraser doesn't appear to be hearing me either. Look, this is important. And seriously important. I uh, represent uh, the south side uh, of Glasgow, which is home to you know, places like Film City. I understand absolutely, and I've got plenty of people that rightly remind me of this, of the importance of the film 
industry in the screen sector in Scotland. I'm not going to comment on uh, Pentland Studios for the reason that Murdo Fraser cited. It is subject uh, at the moment to a planning uh, application and it would be wrong for me to, to comment on that. But we think uh, the progress around Cumbernauld is very, very, very positive progress uh, and I hope we continue to see that move forward uh, so that we do have uh, a fully operational film studio, uh, let me say this again, no later than the end of 2017. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.